Sorry, all yours. Excuse me, Drew. Um, Director Salmon and Director Gurney are in the oh. attendee room with their hands raised. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Uh, Director Lemus is here. Okay. Ariel, thank you for the rescue. I was out there trying to get in like four times. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. I'm sorry, Director Gurney. That's okay. Let's, let's keep moving on me. It, that usually didn't happen, so I just kept retrying. Thanks again, Ariel. Okay, Tarun, you're on mute. Thank you so much. Um, thank you much, so much, Drew. Let's call the meeting to order and hopefully all of our board members are here with the exception of Supervisor Director Hopkins. So uh, roll call please, Drew. Absolutely, good afternoon, uh, directors. We'll start with Director Madeline Agramonte. Here. Director Melanie Bagby. Present. Director Delinda Fisher. Here. Director Gerard Giudice. Here. Director Sarah Gurney. Here. Director Linda Hopkins is absent. Director Ariel Kelly. Here. Director Mark Landman. Here. Director Esther Lemus. Here. Director David Rabbit. Here. Vice Chair Chris Rogers. Here. And Chair Gorin. Here. Thank you, Drew. Uh, now let's move to public comment on items not on our agenda, but are within the subject matter of the SCTA RCPA board. Drew, do we have any members of the public wishing to comment? Um, I do not see any members of the public wishing to comment at this time. Great, thank you. Let's move to the consent calendar and we have a number of items. Uh, the first item A, SCTA RCPA concurrent items. The, minute, uh, the meeting notes from October 11th and continuing to authorize the teleconference meeting in compliance with the Assembly Bill 361 is item 3.2, 3.3, administration is fiscal year 21-22, Q1, financial reporting. Item number B, SCTA items, 3.4, planning, amendment to contract SCTA 20019 with tool design group for work on the Vision Zero Action Plan 3.5 Administration SCTA Administrative Code number seven, which is the second reading. Are there any questions on any of those items on our consent calendar? And I'm seeing no one raise their hands. Drew, do we have any public comment on any of those items? Um, uh, there are no public comment on this item. Okay, let's bring it back to the board. Can I have a motion and accept and a second that we accept uh, the consent calendar? Motion to approve the uh, consent calendar. And second for Madeline. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, and a roll call vote, please, Drew. Director Agramonte. Aye. Director Bagby. Aye. Director Fisher. Aye. Director Judice. Yes. Director Gurney. Aye. Director Kelly. Aye. Director Landman. Yes. Director Lemus. Aye. Director Rabbit. Aye. Vice Chair Rogers. Aye. And Chair Gorin. Aye. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the regular calendar. And our first item on the regular calendar A is SCTA item funding, an update on the status of federally funded projects by jurisdiction. And Suzanne, you or James want to take this over? Uh, actually, Shauna is going to lead this item. And I think she's just joining us right there. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, this item should be fairly brief. Uh, I'm going to see if I can share my screen with you. Nope. Host disabled yep. participant sharing. I just fixed it, Shauna. Okay, thank you. Let's try that again. There we go. Oh, no, that's not it. Let's see. Uh, I've never shared from my Mac before, so I'm trying to pull up the right thing. Nope, all right. 
Drew, would you mind sharing the screen for me? Yeah, let me I'm find it. Just yes. having a little bit of difficulty. So the item before you today was something that we brought before you the uh, a couple in June, and it is the funding obligation history. At the time that we brought it to you in June, we explained that it had been developed through um, pulling up the rest of the obligation histories from the last 15 or so years. And it shows as is on this page that Drew is showing you um, some of the old uh, authorizations that the federal obligations went through. So safety, CMA block grant and the first two uh, one Bay Area grant cycles. The, we've updated it for you because it shows now the last two obligations or um, programming actions that we've gone through. And those were the Safe and Seamless Mobility Quick Strike Program and the STIP, State Transportation Improvement Program cycle 2022. So each of the jurisdictions has a page that shows the obligation history and each, if there is the obligation history, it's highlighted in green. So you can see here on the on the Katadi page that they received a quick strike. So that is showing as the total amount that was programmed. And then uh, you can see that there's an obligation date where that is supposed to occur. That will show up when that occurs. And then we will bring it back to you once every six months. It was very brief just to bring you up to date to make sure that we bring it to you every six months as we promised and to answer any questions that you might have about this reporting. That concludes my report, Madam Chair. I believe you're on mute, Madam Chair. Do we have any questions on this report? And I'm not seeing any hands raised. No, nothing. I see Dr. Dr. Yes, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Okay, just a, a, a comment. It's a fairly straightforward, but you know, after um, you know, during the meeting with my city manager to you know prepare for this meeting, it just reviewing the the, the monies that were applied for. Um, you know, I just would want to underscore the difficulties that the smaller jurisdictions face in in managing some of the reporting on these projects, and something that. Um, you know, I would like to see uh, the the board support is, um, and I'll just just give you a very th th thumbnail example. You know, one of the items on our list is a hundred thousand dollar grant, and for the city of Cloverdale to administer that federal grant um, that was rejected and reapplied for three times. At the end of the day, you know, my my city manager is just to say, you know, honestly. In some scenarios, some of these are so difficult for small jurisdictions to manage that we might be better off just pulling money from our general fund, you know, rather than um, getting a hundred thousand dollar grant. And by the time we by the time we lose so much of our bandwidth um, on on staffing and supporting some of these items, and so you know what I'd like to see the board possibly do is support. SCTA staff working with um, the city managers group to come up with some ideas where uh, we could you know, share staffing to administer some of these very difficult to administer grants. I, I think the staff is doing a great job at SCTA um, helping us try to get projects across the finish line, but they're still very difficult. And so I just, um, if the board would support the SCT with the, having uh, executive director Suzanne Smith work with the city managers to come up with some ideas and scenarios that smaller cities, smaller jurisdictions can be better supported so that the price we pay for going after these federal dollars isn't so dear. Thank you. Um, a great suggestion. And I would include the county CAO in that discussion as well. Uh, it, it's really good to forge a closer relationship with SCTA and the great staff at SCTA with the needs of all of the jurisdictions so that we can be working more effectively together to deliver projects uh, going forward. 
Any other board comments? Drew, do we have any public comment on this item? Uh, we have a board comment from Director Judice. Oh, thank you, Director Judice. Good. Well, uh, that was great, Melanie. Thank you very, very much for those comments. And since I'm naive and new, would that be amortized into the cost of the grant, the support staff time for SCTA? I'm seeing a, a nodding head, but I'm not exactly sure what next steps forward. I, I think that people are smart who are smarter than we are should probably figure that out and bring um, some ideas back to the board. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, if, if, I, if I could just respond briefly, Madam Chair, I think um, the opportunity provided us by this most recent call for projects and the multiple funding sources really enable those discussions to happen more readily than they have in the past. Um, and I think there's there, there does, however, need to be a distinction between sort of size of project and size of city, because if a city get the small city gets a $4 million federal grant, that's, you know, they should be able to deliver a $4 million federal grant, right? I mean, I, but, I, but I do think if it's a $200,000 project, using federal money is not the highest and best use of anybody's time. And, and we're very cognizant of that and wanna, wanna make those programming decisions um, work for everyone. And, and, and I think the, the manner in which we've done this call for projects will really help us. Um, that's our aspiration anyway. Great, thank you. Any other board comments? And I'm looking at the participants and I'm not seeing a hands raised. Drew, do we have any public comments on this item? Uh, no hands raised for public comment, so I don't know public comment at this time. Great, thank you. Any final comments from the board? And Suzanne, we appreciate your suggestion and uh, willingness to use this opportunity to explore the best, most uh, efficient use of resources, both with the cities and the county. Okay, I think uh, that is a report item. It does not need to have a vote on that. Let's move forward to item B, RCPA items planning 4.2, the Urban Land Institute Advisory Services Panel Report. And uh, I believe Tanya is going to report on that. So Tanya, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here, here with you today, sharing the final report from the Urban Land Institute Resilience Advisory Services Panel. So Drew, next slide, please. Brief agenda for the presentation today. I'll go through the issue, background, provide some highlights from the report, talk about next steps, and then the staff recommendation. Next slide, please. So two items before you today. Um, shall the board accept the Urban Land Institute report? And then second, uh, what role should the RCPA play in developing an implementation strategy for the re recommendations contained in the report? Next slide, please. So in terms of background, I've got a couple slides here about the Urban Land Institute. Um, so the mission of ULI is to provide leadership in responsible use of land and in creating thriving and sustainable communities worldwide. And ULI provides a number of services to achieve its mission, which you can see on this slide here, which include the uh, resilience uh, advisory service panels and technical assistance panels. Next slide, please. So uh, ULI has a practice area that focuses specifically on urban resilience and it conducts advisory services panels across the country to address impacts of climate change. And you can see a few examples of reports that ULI has produced here, uh, one called Scorched, which was on heat, and then Living with Water, of course, related to water. Uh, next slide, please. One back, please, Drew. One more back. One more? <clears throat> yeah. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. There we yeah, go. There you go. Um, so ULI's advisory services panels are five-day workshops that provide strategic advice to local jurisdictions. And in 2019, our CPA and our partners in the city of Santa Rosa and the county of Sonoma started working with ULI staff to bring a resilience advisory services panel to Sonoma County, really in response to the 2017 wildfires and understanding that those types of events would continue in the future. 
Funding for our panel was provided by a grant to ULI from the Kresge Foundation and also contributions from the City of Santa Rosa and the County of Sonoma. And lastly, our CPA provided staff support to help organize the panel. Next slide, please. So here you see our amazing group of steering group members, and we convened this group to uh, support planning for the advisory services panel. And in addition to the names shown here, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of Aleka Seville, our former RCPA Director of Climate Programs, John Kessel, who was with the County of Sonoma Office of Recovery and Resiliency, and David Gouin, the former Assistant City Manager uh, with the City of Santa Rosa. They were really instrumental in the planning process prior to uh, leaving us for their, their uh, next assignments. And I'd also like to thank all of our steering group members for their input and guidance on the panel scope and plans. Next slide, please. So the first step the steering group took was to define the panel scope, which is essentially a set of questions that the uh, steering group wanted the panel to address in its recommendations. And I've listed a, at least a summary level of the, whoops, there we go, thank you, Drew. Um, a summary level of the questions here, and they're organized into these three categories, land use and development for wildfire resilience, energy and economic resilience, and equitable governance partnerships and funding. Next slide, please. So based on the scope that the steering group determined, ULI then recruited, recruited a diverse group of panelists who had expertise in the areas that we were interested in getting advice on. So related to wildfire resilience, climate change, equity, and land use. And we very much appreciate the time, the objective perspective, and the expertise, and the enthusiasm, I would say, that the all-volunteer panel brought to its work with Sonoma County. Next slide, please. So our in-person panel it was originally scheduled to be an in-person panel planned for the fall of 2019. And as you may recall, we actually had to postpone the panel several times due to wildfires and then COVID. Um, but we were uh, happily able to conduct the panel virtually in April of this year. Um, to help the panel prepare, our CPA staff put together an extensive briefing book that had information on the 2017, 2019, and 2020 wildfires existing land use planning efforts uh, and impacts of climate change here in Sonoma County. And then during the panel week itself, the all volunteer panel of ULI, ULI experts interviewed stakeholders from a wide range of organizations in the public, private and nonprofit sectors. And then the panel worked together virtually over the course of several days to develop their recommendations in response to our scope questions and based on what they learned um, through the briefing book tour and interviews. And the uh, List that you see here on the right are some of the common themes that the panel heard through their interviews. So the, the theme of disaster being really a constant with us now, um, you know, as an example, we go into the fall now thinking about it as fire seasons. We didn't used to think about fall as fire season. They also noted that they felt the power of our region is not being fully harnessed, that we have a lot of expertise um, in the region that we could, we could pull together more effectively. They noted that our housing policy is climate policy, and also called out the equity impacts of disasters, the lost wages for our working class community, and also the health impacts from the poor air quality and the stress from the disasters. And then lastly, the uniqueness of Sonoma County, which I think is something they really were very interested and enthusiastic about, just recognizing the diversity that we have in terms of uh, you know, larger cities to small hamlets to our unincorporated areas. Next slide, please. So this is a, a brief snapshot of the many stakeholders who participated in the interviews with our panelists, and we also want to thank them for their time and inputs into the process. Next slide, please. So the panel approached its work through three key areas. Um, first, climate resilience. So looking at how the county can come back stronger from, from the challenges that we face and prepare for future effects of climate change. And also noting the, the connections between climate resilience and economic and social resilience. In terms of equity, the panel used um, policy links definition of equity as a just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. The panel called out the disproportionate impact of climate change on our historically marginalized and otherwise disadvantaged communities and noted that these communities are impacted both from the disruption or disaster itself, as well as the cost to recover from those disasters. And then finally, I mentioned in the previous slide in terms of community essence, the panel really noted that we are a, a confederation of cities, hamlets, and unincorporated areas, and they were inspired by the unique character of our different communities and really tried to preserve and enhance this character in their recommendations. Next slide, please. 
So a couple of the key findings or themes that um, came out in the report uh, during the stakeholder interviews, they really heard loud and clear the impact of the collective trauma of the multiple years of disasters that the county has faced, wildfires, floods, COVID, um, and that we've been in, in an almost constant state of emergency management since the 2017 wildfires. And this has had a huge impact on our community. Their recommendations reinforce the importance of work that's already underway or planned, um, really recognizing the progress that Sonoma County has made, and then also identified some new areas for us to consider, such as the One Sonoma concept, which is really a call to action to come together to more effectively coordinate and scale our investments in wildfire resilience. Next slide, please. So the panel organized its recommendations into these four categories that you see here. And they made a total of 40 recommendations, which uh, given our time today, I, I won't go through each one, but did pull out a few to highlight in the next couple of slides, just to give you a sense of what's in the report. If you haven't had a chance to read the whole thing cover to cover, I know it's a fairly lengthy report. Um, so next slide, please. So first in the land use to enhance wildfire resilience category, um, just pulled out four of the recommendations here. Um, so first the panel noted that they saw an opportunity for us to create um, a single uh, aggregated vegetation and fire severity zone map for the county. Um, they found that there were many different sources today for data and maps. We have an excellent collection of resources um, that show things like vegetation, land use, population growth, fire risk, et cetera. But these they found in, documented in different places and updated by different groups. So their idea would be that we put together a single map or perhaps an online data set that would be understandable and accessible by local residents. Um, they also recommended that uh, this map included information that would be useful to firefighters like access roads, fire hydrants, water sources, et cetera. Um, second recommendation uh, was to re-envision the wildland urban interface for the WUI and to establish minimum countywide wildfire construction standard. Um, so they, they called out the 2017 wildfires showing that even areas that we once thought were outside of the danger zone like Coffee Park can burn and be impacted under certain conditions, which we saw during that horrific time in 2017. So they recommend considering all of Sonoma County as if it were completely in a wooey and then developing minimum standards for wildfire construction. We also see that there's an opportunity to look at how these recommendations could align with the work that RCPA has identified that we need to do to retrofit, retrofit our existing buildings for energy efficiency and all electric. The potential mechanisms for transfer of development rights and land buyouts, the panel uh, recommended this as a way uh, to use a market tool to achieve land preservation by allowing a landowner to sever their unused development rights in exchange for compensation from another landowner who wants additional de development rights for another parcel. Um, the panel saw this as a climate adaptation strategy, but also acknowledged that it's a relatively new concept, most often considered by coastal communities at risk from multiple types of flooding. Uh, but they saw it as a way to reduce future risk and re redirect development to more fire safe areas. And of course, we would want to do this in a way that supports our existing infill strategies in each of our communities. And then lastly, um, expanding urban forest management strategies. And this is interesting. Um, we actually have heard uh, just recently from some of our local jurisdictions that there is that seems to be some interest in a countywide approach to urban forest management planning. And this strategy could help um, from a resilience standpoint, also address the urban heat island effect. And of course, we need to be done in a way that works with our drought conditions and doesn't increase fire risk. Next slide, please. So then moving on to the energy and economic resilience uh, recommendations, and I'll just call out three here for you. Um, the first was to increase community energy education. Um, recognizing that the more education we do around, say, for example, retrofitting for energy efficiency, this will lower the demand for energy resources, you know, lighten the load on our grid, help us transition to more local sources of power. Um, the panel specifically called out and recognized many of Sonoma Clean Power's equity-focused programs and the work they're doing there. And then lastly noted that as we share more information about the what and why of this energy transition from gas, fossil fuel to all electric, that this would be a way to help address stakeholder concerns about the impact of wildfires on our electricity grid as we move to increase our reliance on that source of power. So really getting more of that information out uh, in a visible way. The second recommendation um, to develop a regional energy resilience strategy was really connected with the panel's um, recommendation of a one Sonoma approach to allow us to get more federal funding or make us more competitive for federal funding 
to provide equitable access to emerging technologies and solutions. Um, the panel noted the importance of making these energy resilience decisions in a way that supports our many demographic and cultural groups, so really the equity lens there, and then an opportunity for the energy infrastructure decisions made in this area to really help create a more inclusive economy with green jobs, improved environmental conditions, and new centers of economic growth that would help also address environmental injustices. And in this regional strategy, they recommended uh, looking at uh, things like vegetation management, undergrounding of utility lines, and securing funding. And then lastly, around innovative energy storage, just recognizing that there's a lot happening in this space, um, rapidly evolving solutions that are both centralized and localized. You know, as we see, for example, the interest, rising interest in microgrids and solar with battery backup. Um, also lots of research underway regarding alternatives to lithium ion battery solutions. Um, so some of the constraints and restrictions of those solutions might start to, to be um, eliminated. And then also noting that the electrification of transportation will have a big impact on our energy systems. And we've certainly started hearing some of those questions and concerns from stakeholders. And so incorporating our transition from fossil fuels to electric vehicles will be a critical component of this whole planning process. And then lastly, the panel called out thermal star storage as another approach to addressing, addressing energy needs and resiliency, and that this is an area that they see of growing interest and in research. Next slide, please. All right, housing development and urban planning. Um, so one recommended recommendation was to reevaluate street standards for walkability and pedestrian safety and to incorporate climate resilient strategies. And so pulled out a couple images here that show a before and after view of a suburban streetscape that's been retrofitted to be more climate resilient. And so the panel noted that we have opportunities to adjust our street standards to optimize road width um, by re and replacing that extra space that used to be pavement with uses that maximize our climate benefit and safety, like drought and fire tolerant trees and rain gardens. Another recommendation was to reduce or eliminate parking requirements in downtown core. And I know that local jurisdictions are looking very closely um, at, at parking requirements and making, making changes. And the panel just recommended that we continue that work, looking at arrangements where parking could be included in offsite structures. So for example, sharing underused municipal garages um, and looking at design types that would reduce the parking that's needed, like a center block strategy where an association of landowners, for example, um, would jointly manage and use a central parking facility, opening other potential sites for infill and higher value uses. And then lastly here to develop a single menu to guide by right entitlements. And the panel noted efforts already underway to promote density and development. Um, so for example, the, the downtown planning in Santa Rosa, and they recommended adopting similar measures in smaller communities throughout the county. And then finally, to coordinate various city and county general specific and area plans to create a clear menu that developers could rely on to plan their projects and receive by right entitlements. And this would provide that certainty that developers are looking for uh, and encourage them to meet the planning objectives, objectives of the jurisdictions. And so just to note, as we look at all these recommendations, they are very much um, supporting multiple objectives that we have. So our objectives around increasing housing, climate resilience, adaptation, and mitigation. Uh, next slide, please. So the last set of recommendations relate to equitable governance and making the business case. And these, again, really tie back to the panel's vision of the One Sonoma, a coordinated and collaborative effort to address the, the recommendations in the report. Um, so one, one recommendation was to apply for funding regionally to become more competitive, and that this would help make the most of the available funding and making us more successful in securing additional funding to fill any gaps. And then second, to adopt, develop, and implement the economic resilience model that the panel put together, um, which actually, uh, if you look at the report itself, I believe there's a link to the spreadsheet tool online if you want to go in and dig into it in more detail. Uh, but this is a, a tool the panel created to estimate financial outcomes for the county under two scenarios they modeled, a business as usual and an excellent resilience scenario. Um, and this is meant to be really just an example. Um, we have gotten a few questions about some of the numbers that were used in the model. And really, we, if we wanted to use this model, we would need to go in and, and really evaluate and, and update the numbers to, to the scenarios that we wanted to look at. But this could be a decision-making tool that would support a one Sonoma approach to collaboration funding and prioritization. Uh, let's see, next slide, Drew. So in terms of next steps, um, we have scheduled a follow-up meeting with the ULI steering group to discuss the panel's recommendations and potential next steps. 
Um, ULI has already suggested to us some additional ways that it could support implementation of the recommendations. As an example, um, ULI could convene a technical assistance panel that could help us look at recommendations like transfer of development rights or the one Sonoma concept. And so a key question for the board today is what role, if any, should RCPA play in advancing the recommendations from the report? So last slide, I believe. Um, so again, our recommendation to accept the Urban Land Institute um, report and then provide direction to staff on our next steps and RCPA's role in the development of an implementation strategy for these uh, recommendations. So that concludes my presentation and I'll turn it back to you, Madam Chair, for any questions. And well, Madam Chair, you're muted. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tanya, so much. I really appreciate the PowerPoint presentation giving us a snapshot of the report. And I hope the uh, board directors have had a chance to at least sift through it. A lot of good stuff in there. Uh, but um, it is almost a mile wide and an inch deep, perhaps. And how do we actually use that to implement it? And I was thinking of uh, specifically the transfer of development rights. Is that something that we could pursue? And it has been suggested to us by Greenbelt Alliance and others that we would consider the transfer of development rights from uh, the wildfire zones to more urban areas. And I was really flummoxed to figure out how that would be accomplished. Are we going to say to all of the uh, survivors of the wildfire, sorry, you can't develop, you can't rebuild there? I don't think that's the direction that the board wants to take. Um, but uh, you know, I that that was a consideration for flooding, for example. So let's open it up for board questions and provocative uh, conversation. <clears throat> And uh, Delinda Fisher, followed by Mark Landman. And thank you. I actually don't have a question, but um, uh, yeah, in reading this report, I wish we could implement all of it immediately. Um, thank you to the Urban Land Institute, always forward thinking. Um, although seven stories in downtown Petaluma may not go over very well right in the right in the beginning. Um, but I'm 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 wondering, um, you know, the, I'm starting to question the role of the RCPA, right? And when sort of why we're here now that I've been here for ten months and starting to get a feel for it, and um, and this report in in talking about us um, creating this Go Sonoma or this One Sonoma and and treating ourselves on a much more regional basis. And, you know, I am convinced that in order to meet our, our goal of climate neut uh, neutrality by 2030 in Petaluma, that we are going to have to be doing this as a part of a county, that us doing it alone is not gonna be enough. And so I I'm intrigued by this, this idea of funding sort of countywide, right? So, and, and does the RCPA have the authority to go after federal funding, particularly if we, and hopefully we'll have that on the later in the agenda, the package that just got um, approved on Friday, but do we have the authority to go after funding sort of as a county as a whole um, with all the jurisdictions and the county for, you know, say we want to implement the master bicycle and pedestrian plan that we have or something or pieces of it? The short, the short answer is it depends, but generally, yes. Um, there are some times where, especially at the state level, things get written as city and county can do X. But if it says anything greater than that, like special districts, or if it goes beyond saying the eligible recipients are city and county, um, then we, we typically can. Um, one of the reasons... RCPA was created um, was because in 2009, this, the big federal stimulus program under Obama was passed and there was uh, a lot of money for energy efficiency. And we started doing that work, but weren't supposed to be because we were, uh, we are, our um, jurisdiction was purely transportation, uh, hence the change to state law, but we definitely were a recipient of a lot of those federal funds um, and did that work more regionally. So follow up to question, you, you just asked all the jurisdictions to give you a five top projects. Do we as a region have five top projects? Uh, 
No, I think we've got, uh, we've got, I mean, we've got our climate mobilization strategy that talks about electrification, for example, as a top priority. I mean, elect, uh, electric vehicles as a top priority and building electrification as a top priority. Um, but I wouldn't say we have quite the definition around it that say that call for projects did for infrastructure. But Tanya, I don't know, how would you respond to that? No, I, I think I think you're right. We, we have those priorities that we identified in the mobilization strategy and kind of one of the next steps that we've talked about related to the climate funding actually is, you know, if we were to get additional funding, what spe more specifically would it fund? And so I think that identification of top priorities for the county more specifically in those areas that Suzanne mentioned, you know, is an important next step. Um, you know, so do we have, for example, an existing building electrification initiative and what, what does that consist of and are all the cities in the county signed on to that? Um, so that could be one example. And so what comes first, the funding or the, the proposal, right, that can then go after funding? Yeah. So I think it's a little bit of both. So we have done a good amount of work on, say, EV charging infrastructure and uh, where the, the needs are greatest throughout the county. Um, Sonoma Clean Power has done some work on that as well. So putting that together and then saying, okay, here's what hasn't been funded in that and going after money with some, you know, it may not have the precise corner or parking stall, but we know it needs to be in this block, you know, and so you kind of do the bigger scale planning, then get some money and do the more precise implementation uh, design. Okay. And I just one last thing before I, I go off um, in terms of the recommendations that you want from us, I guess, the, you know, we know that our CPA funding and staff is, is, you know, has this much capacity and we're sort of at capacity. So, you know, I'd love to say, you know, go ahead and implement the entire report, but that's absolutely unrealistic. So I look forward to hearing from you about what is possible. And maybe that comes back after you've met with the, the other stakeholders again. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Director Landman, followed by Sarah Gurney, followed by Ariel Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the report. Very much, uh, very many things in here I like. Uh, a lot of good things. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, certainly happy to accept it. I'm not sure if I'm ready personally to implement it all right off the bat today, even if we could, just hearing what the chair was saying, a, a good example of how some of these are very complex items have ramifications. It might not even be clear to us right off the bat. So obviously, I mean, I personally have always supported working regionally, but they do have to be consensus items. Uh, and that's the challenge. Um, there's much we can do and find a consensus, I think, with all our cities and the county together through SETA and RCPA, but that does have to come first, I would think. Uh, but as the chair pointed out, one example of something that might have had some potential dissonance to it, as I heard her explain it, another thing that jumped out at me in this. Uh, I really, really liked uh, how this group's recognition of community essence, how there's a variability in all the different communities, uh, and they're all different. And I love that recognition that it's not one size fits all, something that's kind of a cliche, but actually has a lot of truth to it. Um, but at the same time, then I heard briefly a recommendation that smaller cities might be a, re a suggestion that they implement copying Santa Rosa's density. Uh, that's the type of thing that may work some places. It may work to some degree in other places, but obviously it's something that I certainly wouldn't want to just, as a group say, we agree with it because I suspect not all of our communities would. So I'm certainly happy to accept this today. And I think we should have some more discussions about what we can do as a group, coming up with a top five list of projects that we regionally do want to work and compete for dollars to work on, I think is a great idea. Uh, but with those caveats that we do have to agree to consensus in, in our communities and with our colleagues as well. So thank you for that, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Landman. Uh, Director Gurney. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm very interested in the comments from Petaluma and Gitati and very resonant with the comments from Cloverdale earlier uh, to me, this approach of one Sonoma has great attraction because um, 
of that notion that we will be more effective as we go regional. But for me as a small city, it raises this equity issue between the cities and the counties, because I'll just characterize uh, my group this way. We're a very small city with big needs, very little money and overworked staff with no bandwidth, but we have a great brain trust in our community and we're a geographic outlier. So I don't know how, as we go forward with this, Sebastopol has an equitable relationship with Santa Rosa, Petaluma, Roner Park, and 101 corridor. You, you see that um, difficulty that the regional approach presents as attractive as it is. I think we, uh, like uh, Katadi, I'm very grateful that the uh, ULI noticed the differences, communities, and, and that resonated as we try and figure out something regional that we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gurney. If I, and if I could just maybe add one comment about the kind of the context of the report really started looking um, primarily at the city of Santa Rosa and the county of Sonoma as the two main sponsors of the effort. Um, and I think what the panel then tried to do is look at ways that learnings from those larger communities could be applied to smaller communities um, on a regional approach where there was agreement that that should be done to Director Landman's point. So not to say that all of these recommendations should be rolled out to all of the communities, but really what could we learn from those larger communities that could be applied, so. Thank you, Tanya, for the clarification. Uh, Director Kelly, followed by Director Bagby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a question for staff around uh, what the conversations have, have been so far around kind of the different alphabet soup of agencies across the county around both support for the, this report as well as um, kind of ownership of different pieces and, and also kind of the, um, the uh, unordained groups such as like all of the planning directors that meet regularly or the city managers that meet regularly, uh, what their feedback has been and and also kind of who would be the appropriate entities um, as, a, as a representative of the Ag and Open Space District is another hat that I wear and I know I could see them um, carrying some of this forward, uh, but I'm curious, you know, what do you think is the natural place for RCPA to lead on uh, and what are the other entities doing to support uh, or what do you what do you think they should be doing as many people on this body also wear other hats great question director kelly um so we're the we're really presenting this to you as the first group that's seeing the final report um, the steering group saw an earlier version of a draft version of the report so i'm seeing um, our next step of meeting with the steering group to really get their inputs in terms of um, roles and, and how this might be implemented across the county. So we're just kind of starting that process of reaching out to the different groups, I would say. And in terms of RCPA's role, certainly one possibility would be to continue the role that we played working with ULI and the city of Santa Rosa and the county of Sonoma to date, which is playing kind of a coordinating and support role. Um, so we could potentially carry that forward to the implementation strategy. But I think Director Fisher raised a great point that we are currently um, you know, we're, we're maxed out in terms of what we're working on with the mobilization strategy. So if the board felt like our CPA was, you know, the, the best organization to help provide that framework going forward, we would need to figure out how do we, how do we fund that effort uh, and, and get some additional, whether it be staff or consulting support um, to move that forward. So um, I would say in the very early stages of thinking about what might the implementation path be, but really wanted to start with our board to get your direction and feedback around what that could be. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Uh, Director Bagby. Oh, thank you, Tanya. Those are um, very helpful comments to kind of um, uh, clarify the path forward. I, I mean, I, I too was very receptive to uh, the report overall, and I and I appreciate that this is the first pass um, that this board is getting, and it's going to need to you know move on to several other entities, and and very cognizant of the fact that we're we're really discussing. You know what our what is our CPA's role in in implementing um, this report? Who who are we going to be partnering with? Who are we going to be working with? Um, and I I really appreciate the the comments of um, so many of my my board members. You know, one of the the items that I called out in my notes was on page two hundred eight and for funding um, more regionally. And I think that what you've heard from the board is that. Um, it's not that we want the same 
we, we don't want to, we, we can't carbon copy policies across cities because it isn't appropriate. But if we have a plan, like a, if we had a countywide complete streets program or something like that, that we had all, um, we, we, we had all bought in and said, you know, this is our portion of, of a countywide complete streets program and we applied uh, for funding um, communally, then we might have some additional um, chances for success. I think I, that's how I'm in interpreting that. Am, am I right, Tanya? That's how I would interpret it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's really not about, yeah, a cookie cutter, what works in Rourke Park, what works in Santa Rosa is going to work in Cloverdale because that's not the case. We're not going to see the densities, we're not going to see the building heights, but if we all agree on um, particular policy areas, then we could uh, apply together. So um, I think that's what I'm hearing. And just, yeah. just a couple of other call outs that I want to make to the report, just so that you can give this feedback to, to ULI um, staff, and it's uh, they're it's not at all um, calling out errors in the report, but I want to call it just a couple of items that I noticed that uh, I was looking for and I didn't see, um, you know, specifically, um, we're not, I, I didn't see any specific mentions of the successes that we've already had on financing for wildfire and earthquake resiliency. Skype is not mentioned by name that I could find <laughs> the report. Um, and some of the cinema clean power programs, specific programs that are have already been successes in Advanced Energy Center, it might just be a an issue of when Advanced Energy Center opened and when you know some of the, the data was collected, or I, I didn't necessarily see that. And then also on page 177, they do specifically call out the 2019 PSPS and um, fire event, but there's no mention mention of the gas shutoff, which was um, uh, you know, for nearly five days, along with electricity, that was a, a huge, uh, had a huge impact, especially on our most vulnerable populations in the, the North County. So I, I just wanted to, you know, make sure that they heard the feedback that um, along with those PSPS events, if we're also going to have gas outages, we're also suffering there as well. Um, and I, I heard, um, you know, mention on page 192 of you know, regional um, energy partnerships. And of course, new information is that um, Sonoma Clean Power is pursuing, you know, possibly a um, geysers um, opportunity area amongst Sonoma, Mendocino and, and Lake County. So I guess, so one of my questions would be, um, how do we make sure that this is a living document that just that gets updated um, there are some recommendations here where I think we've already had some considerable, some considerable success. So how do we, you know, kind of make people aware of what the, the successes that we've already had, and then where we also have more work to, uh, to, to accomplish? It's a, a great question. And I guess to, to your points about the items that, that weren't acknowledged in the report, just to say that the panel, um, I can't remember how many pages we had in the briefing book, but it was a pretty big briefing book. Um, and these were all volunteer panelists. So they you know, certainly had a lot of information thrown at them in a short amount of time. And I can definitely provide the feedback about some items that you know, if we were gonna do the report uh, or update it, we, we would wanna mention those. Um, but just to say, I think the panel um, did a great job with the, with the time and the resources they had. Um, but in terms of kind of how we would reflect this in the report going forward, I don't see us really updating the report itself, but I think that would be part of our implementation strategy to look at, you know, of these recommendations, where have we made progress, let's call that out. And then where we haven't made progress or we wanna prioritize for more work, then what's the approach to, to tackling that? So definitely kind of looking at the recommendations and assessing which ones we're making, have, have done work on versus not. So that would definitely be, I think, a, a key next step with the report. Oh, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, question, have we sent out the report to all of the city managers and our partner agencies, regional, sub-regional agencies? I don't, we haven't sent it out to the city managers yet, I don't believe. Um, okay. It's basically gone out to our steering group and, and to this board. All right, I, I would encourage you to send links to the report to all the planning, uh, the community development directors, and the city managers, perhaps uh, all of the, all, we could send out the information to our 
um, electeds, but it might be good if you just say, please distribute this to all of the city council members, uh, supervisors, et cetera. I, it is um, a base of information that I think bears some thought and some pensiveness and connections, how we use this information to link out to other bodies, for example, the climate ad hoc uh, at the county under Barbara Lee and, and Anna Yip, uh, and uh, all of the folks who are looking at these strategies to start forging the connections and the collaborations. And then maybe the uh, it will become more obvious and clear about the synergies uh, between the agencies and how we might collaborate even further for funding and development. Okay, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not seeing any other director's hands. Oh, Esther is here. Esther, do you have comments, Esther? I just wanted to thank you, Chair Gorn, for that suggestion. I agree, I think it should go to the cities and towns. Um, a lot of, I actually really like the recommendations and I think there's some overlap with some, some of the work that many of us are already doing, um, but certainly I, I think that's a recommendation and I would uh, concur with that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Director Lemus. Uh, Drew, do we have any public comment on this? Uh, yes, we do. Let me go get that timer up. Oh, and through the chair, if I may, could we have staff also just um, copy and paste the, the link to the ULI report in the chat? Yes. And I think, and I think Drew sent us a, or someone sent us uh, the link to the report and so we might just send that to us again. Okay, so on Director Bagby, I'll send the email out to the board again with that link. Um, and then for public comment, we will start with Rick Lutman. Rick, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Chair Gorin. Uh, I'm Rick Lutman. I'm a member of the Citizens Advisory Committee to this group. Uh, as an appointee of the League of Women Voters of Sonoma County. I wanted to comment on one matter that was touched on briefly in this report, and that is parking. Um, people like it when parking is free and when there's a lot of it, but uh, uh, we're moving into an era where it's up. As we speak, the world's leaders are meeting in Glasgow to discuss the, the, the greatest threat to civilization that, that we've ever uh, encountered as a species. Greenhouse gases, we've got to reduce them. And one way to do that is to reduce vehicle miles traveled. We don't do that by making it pleasanter to drive cars. So <clears throat> um, I would support the idea of making parking less available and making it uh, more expensive. Uh, this has to be done countywide because if, for example, Petaluma suddenly decided to charge for parking downtown, that would drive customers to other neighboring cities and the business community would be very unhappy. So it would have to happen all, all through the county. Also, we can't just do that and move in one direction, making driving less uh, attractive. We have to make the alternatives more attractive. That means um, a richer bike network. That means uh, uh, denser public transit means transit oriented development so that people can live and work close to convenient uh, transit. Uh, one final comment, you were talking about sending this out to other places. I'd like to suggest you include the Citizens Advisory Committee as uh, uh, one uh, other a a a entity that should have a voice in, uh, in this matter. Thank you, Rick. All right, thank you. The next person I have in line is Beverly Shore. Beverly, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Great, thank you. And um, I am a recent appointee to the RCPA and have read this. These documents both excite me and overwhelm me. Um, I think something that would be extremely helpful before this was sent out to any other cities or committees. Um, 
I think prioritizing all of these things based on you know, a, a list of priorities that the counties have would be extremely useful so that we don't get the spaghetti factor, everything, you know, we shouldn't all wade through all this information and come up with, uh, you know, like 50 different priorities. We should have five priorities and be able to prioritize them. And my other suggestion is that funding is a, is a huge obstacle and it would be very helpful um, there's millions and millions of dollars av available for many of these types of projects. If we had links to the type of private or, or government funding that might be available for these different projects, I think it would help also in the prioritization since we don't ha all have sufficient funds to do everything on the list, even though we may have the desire. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Uh, next I have in line is Pete Gang. Pete, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, Drew. Um, I just want to make a very short comment echoing and affirming uh, Rick's comments. Uh, the idea of a countywide complete streets initiative commitment would be sheer brilliance and transformative. Also, um, when this report is released to planning commissioners and city council members, it would be great if it were also made readily available on the SCTA website to members of the public. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Pete. Uh, Chair Gorn, I, oh, well, we've got one more. Uh, Dan Riley, I have you up next. I permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Dan, Dan Riley. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry, go. I was, yep, I was on mute, so sorry. Uh, no worries, um, you can start. Is there a liaison group between all the local agencies to centralize communications on these projects and see what other agencies are currently working on and, and um, I mean, that that's basically the, the essence of the question, is there a liaison group between all the local agencies to help uh, centralize some of these projects? And again, the, the, the communication between um, all the agencies and what they're currently working on. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, Chair Gorn, that concludes uh, public comment. I don't see any other members of the public wishing to speak. Great, thank you. Uh see if I'm, I'm not muted. Oh, um, there are a couple of questions there. Um, you know, it's a question that everybody has. How do we communicate and coordinate all of the projects uh, with SCTA and the various jurisdictions? Is it obviously through this body, uh, but is there a website that, or can we think about uh, compiling a website with the various lists from the from the jurisdictions, the county and SCTA. I guess I would I would want to know what we are what what the goal of tracking is and what so we have our comprehensive transportation plan. Let's talk about that for as an example um, that has a very extensive list of projects. It's available online. There's that piece. Then we've got a list of projects once they're funded, which is part of what you saw today. Um, but we actually are aspiring to make that much more robust and uh, better, for lack of a, like a better term, um, by the beginning of the year. Um, the same is, is not quite as clear probably on the climate side because it's so much more broad. So we can talk about energy efficiency projects that are happening or EV charging that is happening, but it's not, at, unless it's specific municipal projects, maybe we could track that. Um, we are not uh, that I am aware of at this point, but I guess I just, I would like to hear more from the board about what what the aspiration is for, for what information you would like collected and sort of um, tracked. 
Well, let me give you an example. Um, I think a number of us are focused on bicycle projects. And of course, we've seen maps through SCTA that um, really highlight a project here, project there, project there. I had a member, uh, my appointee to the Bicycle and, and Pedestrian Advisory Committee quit because it was so difficult to understand and learn where the bicycle projects were, how are they being planned and the dashboard of completion. And I'm not expecting a response, but that's one example of something that we could consider uh, in perhaps doing a, an interesting job of coordination and communication to the community on the success we're having with completing bike lanes and paths. So I'll let you mull over that. I'm not expecting a response, but it may be one. And I would love to maybe talk with Tanya behind the scenes uh, for the Urban Land Institute. Um, are there similar recommendations that they could suggest to us uh, as um, good territory for communication and collaboration? And so let me ask you, Tanya, you were asking for direction uh, from the report. And I don't know that we've given you um, information, given you direction. Have you gleaned anything? We've asked a lot of questions and so we're still pondering. Yeah, but I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. I think what I'm hearing is definitely recognition um, or appreciation of many of the recommendations in the report. Um, I think lots of questions about, you know, kind of what's next and what does this mean and, and where should we focus? And I, I guess what I would recommend at this point is that our CPA goes ahead with the meeting with our steering group and get their feedback and inputs in terms of, you know, what do they see as the priorities and how might they recommend that we organize this work going forward uh, and then perhaps bring something more concrete back to this board in terms of here's how we see our CPA really fitting into this bigger picture. Um, and I would say from my perspective, and I think as an organization, we, we really just wanna see that this report isn't something that sits on the shelf, as I heard somebody say in another meeting today, um, but that we really do take some of the recommendations and, and are able to move them forward. You know, They may not all be things that we want to advance at this point in time, but um, really you know, getting your feedback and the steering group's feedback on, on where do we wanna start. So that would be my recommendation. So I really appreciate all of your questions and feedback. And thanks, Donna. Um, I think incorporated in one of the public comments is was the suggestion that the link be forwarded to members of our advisory committees, I would say <laughs> plural. And so it might be a, because of the interconnectedness of the report and the thought put in behind it. So you might send it to those folks volunteering their time for their consideration. Yeah, and I imagine we could we could carve out maybe a little bit of time on some of those advisory committees agenda, certainly for the climate action advisory committee, we will, um, but to share or make a brief presentation on the report as well, but we'll definitely send the link out. Uh, and I see that Drew has posted in the chat as well. Great, thank you. And we have a couple more comments. Let's start with Ariel Kelly, followed by Delinda Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think my, my recommendation would be that there are several advisory bodies and boards of directors of other agencies across Sonoma County. And I would love to, at, at minimum, make sure that they're aware of the report that it's presented to them, but also um, to, to seek you know, buy-in and support and ownership from other entities if it is something that we don't want to just have it sit on a shelf. And to say that we don't think that it's appropriate for one agency to have to carry the whole uh, project forward or the whole plan forward and, and implement, um, but to identify what are the priorities of other agencies and would they be interested in carrying forward certain pieces of it. Um, and also to share that with our fellow council members or supervisors to ask for their, their support and interest level in, in identifying what are the pieces of this that would make sense for our various jurisdictions. It's again, not a one size fits all approach, um, but there definitely were specific call outs in there that I know were directed at the city of Healdsburg uh, that were you know not very um, veiled around some of our housing policies and otherwise. And I intend to, to bring that back to my fellow council members to say, you know, what are we doing uh, to carry our, our part of this regional effort? And so I think 
having those those conversations and, and figuring out holistically how we can all collaborate on it um, as an interim step to to implementation would be helpful. And I would if there's all feedback of us, on people saying they don't want to move it forward, understanding why and identifying those those issues as well. Sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you. I would encourage all of us, if we know of advisory committees and other realms, uh, to either forward this link to them uh, specifically or forward the information to Tanya uh, for sending this out. And let me see who is next. Was it, uh, uh, was Delinda followed by David Rabbit? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, one thing when reading this report that stands out is what they thought was most um, important to do was to create a singular aggregated vegetation and fire severity zone map for the county. And so at a minimum, we might take a look at that. Um, you know, it's not something that's in my wheelhouse or something I think about, um, but I'm sitting down here in Petaluma. So, um, you know, it, how important is that? And I guess, why did they think that that was so important um, and how would it be used? And is that something that we have the cap capacity to create um, would be a question I have. Good suggestion. Uh, David Rabbit. No, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I look at this report and I see it as an assessment or um, of work that's really underway and the, and the need to uh, kind of coalesce and bring everything together. If you go down, I mean, there's bits and pieces that are being done by many different organizations, and I don't doubt that we need to get it all into one uh, in one location. But um, you know, the brick grant for home hardening, for instance, is um, you know it takes a while to go and achieve the to get the dollars in, but 50 million uh, is now available for uh, moving in that direction. And I know that uh, to the chair, you know, your comment regarding the transfer of development rights, we had that conversation some years ago. And uh, I think it leads a lot of uh, questions that are uh, more questions than answers uh, in okay. terms of what are, you, what are you transferring? How close do you come to a taking? And certainly after a disaster where you're getting paid to rebuild your home on a specific piece of property, uh, sacrificing that for a, a development right elsewhere, just it doesn't make personal financial sense, uh, let alone anything else. So I think that uh, to me, it's really more about the uh, kind of pulling everything together into one into one uh, central location. But and there's a lot of there's a lot of work going on on many of these facets, um, and um, it's just at different places, and uh, it needs to be coordinated better. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I think we have gone round and round. A interesting report, provocative report, and I may have conversations with my two planning commissioners about this. Um, and it, uh, as the alternatives for the Sonoma Developmental Center have been released, and there will be a public meeting on Saturday, I think at 10 o'clock, 10 to 11.30, uh, you might want to register uh, to participate in the Zoom. I wish we could all get together for five or six hours and hash over the maps, but we might be thinking of the Urban Land Institute's report and how that might um, factor into the development or redevelopment of that site or Sinead uh, or any of the sites you have in the city and recognizing that um, in, in response to Delinda Fisher, as part of the materials, there is a map of the developmental center that lists the fire severity zones. Uh, and they're really close because the fires came onto the campus for sure. So this is a report. Uh, we do not need to have uh, action, motion or second or a vote on this. Really want to thank Tanya and all of you actually for participating in, in many of the discussions uh, for the Urban Land Institute. Uh, it was disappointing to me that my day was already booked and I didn't even have a couple of hours to participate. So the report is fascinating reading for me for sure. Let's move on to item 4.3 funding, funding for the climate ad hoc report out. And I know the chair of the Climate Ad Hoc is, as we speak, in Glasgow, Scotland, um, and posting a few few pictures. And apparently, they know all. That's the report that she sends back. We just need to figure out 
what all is and what is relevant for Sonoma County. So uh, who, Suzanne, who is going to do the report out for this? Is that Tanya? Um, I can, I can uh, jump in on this. The, uh, and please other, ad, you know, the ad hoc committee members uh, should jump in as well. But uh, just a quick summary. The last meeting was held jointly with the um, County Board of Supervisors ad hoc committee that is working on fire safety and um, the discussion. Not, not to be confused with the climate ad hoc because David serves on the fire safety ad hoc. I serve on the climate ad hoc. And I said, wait a minute, why are they talking to them? <laughs> um, Right, so we couldn't include both because that was a quorum issue. Um, but uh, the, uh, the main agenda item was to discuss timing and any potential overlap um, with the fire measure or a potential fire measure, a potential open space district measure and a potential climate measure. Um, not to cut to the chase too quickly, but the, the, the bottom line was it seemed that um, Ag Preservation and Open Space is not looking at the immediate future for a reauthorization and that the sort of integration between climate and open space was far more connected than the integration of a climate measure and the fire measure. Um, that was, so I, I think leaving that meeting, it was, um, I think my takeaway was RCPA should proceed with whatever discussions it wants to have around a climate measure. And um, there's sort of little risk of, of significant overlap with any potential fire measure. Also that the fire measure is looking at the potential of the primary uh, in June, I mean, in 2022. Um, and you know, obviously, RCPA's made no decisions about when or if, uh, which election cycle uh, we might pursue. Uh, so that was uh, that was the upshot of, of the discussion. Great, thank you. For those of you who participated in uh, that conversation with Fire Services, uh, do you have anything to add, uh, David? Any comments? Director Bagby has our hand up. Uh, uh, David, and then Director Bagby. I think that summary was pretty good. I, th I think for the fire, um, time is a little bit, time is of the essence, obviously, because the county has put up some dollars to make some some things happen that then would get reimbursed through uh, through the measure eventually and to build upon that. Um, so it's kind of this domino effect that is happening and that's been underway. And that's that's part of what uh, we're dealing with. Uh, stay tuned because it's, it's still, Far from being uh, far from coalesced into a, a package. Right. Thank you. Stay tuned on that one, uh, Director Bagby. Yeah, I was just curious. What part did dis the discussion of the smart sales tax measure renewal have in um, either of those conversations? Um, there was acknowledgement that there would be one, but it it was not. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think. The concern or impetus for the meeting with fire was expectations around sort of direct programs that would be funded with a measure um, and whether or not a fire measure or a climate measure would consider funding them. Uh, I don't think that same overlap exists with SMART. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think that, you know, going forward, it would be nice to be considered since um, SMART is was not part of the uh, transportation renewal. So it's something that we're definitely going to have to be aware of going forward. Sure. There are a lot of discussions ahead. Um, first, for the purpose, um, the financing mechanism, the timing, and within that context, always, we would be looking at what other taxing proposals might be on the same ballot. Um, we don't necessarily want to have this collision of financing mechanisms on the ballot. Any other comments on that report out? Can I just make a comment? It really was about whether or not there was any synergy with these other groups that were going out. And, you know, <laughs> we sort of piggyback on it. And, and that's when we thought ag and open space, it's this urban rural, you know, um, sort of combination that needs to be taken a look at. And so 
it, my take on it was that that's that's why there was more synergy there than with the fire piece. But you know, certainly to to uh, Director Bagby's point, you know, we're just in the very preliminary discussions, and you know, is the sales tech measure even appropriate, or should we, you know, figure out some other way to do it? So we're just we're that was just the first avenue we're going down because it was the quickest and the most the one that came right at us. So um, so we're continuing on. How about our very own local carbon dividend? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay, so um, Chris says, why not? Let's think about that. Uh, any other comments? That is a report and a public comment. Drew, do we have any public comments? Um, no members of the public have raised their hands, so no public comment. <clears throat> okay, great. Any final comments from the board? Discussion is ongoing. Thank you so much. Okay, now uh, we have come to the end of our uh, formal meetings on the regular calendar, but we have some reports and announcements that we never seem to get to. And Suzanne said, please, please, I have some things that I need to say. So let me just start off uh, the executive committee report. Uh, we did talk about vision zero, why FCTA is proposing what it did and that we approved. And secondly, the executive committee discussed uh, the process uh, for an evaluation of our executive director. If you have any comments that you would like to uh, give to us, deliver to us, you can email me and we will include them in the evaluation going forward. Uh, and we're hopeful that over the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll complete the evaluation and, um, and um, our executive director, Suzanne Smith, did provide uh, two years of, uh, of goals and the work plan going forward. Very revealing, absolutely. We, our staff, uh, first of all, I wanna thank everybody, starting with our executive director, Suzanne Smith, Tanya Narath, James Cameron, Shauna Goss, uh, Drew, Chris Barney, I think I'm forgetting somebody or other, um, but an amazing team. Thank you all so much for what you do. You just have this breadth of experience that you wow me every single meeting. So thank you so much. And Suzanne, who did I forget? Anybody? <laughs> Um, you've got Janet Spillman and Dana oh, Gray Jan. and our accounting staff. And uh, I do actually want, and BC, and um, I do want to take a second, if I could, to introduce our newest staff member. Um, David Ripperda is, uh, has joined us, and he is the, oh, I hate messing up titles, but uh, he's the assistant of programming and projects. And there he is on the screen. We stole him from San Joaquin County. Um, or He didn't work for the county, but he worked in transportation uh, over in the Central Valley and is uh, now a resident in Sonoma County. And we're thrilled to have his experience with rail capital projects, uh, funding programs. Um, uh, whole, he worked at the our sister agency in San Joaquin County for a while and then at the Regional Rail Commission um, that's building passenger rail projects in the Central Valley, not high-speed rail, regular high-speed rail, I mean regular rail. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's been here a couple of weeks now and we couldn't be happier. So you will well, send for him to come. You know, it, it might be good. We do hear reports from folks um, on this subject and this subject, but maybe if we have a light agenda next month, it might be great to have a little get to know you from for all of the staff at SCTA or CPA, uh, because they're often they're hidden heroes and we would like to get to know them. Great, thank you. Okay, so that was the executive committee report and we will complete the evaluation. If you have any comments, please send them uh, to me or one of the executive <laughs> committee members. Uh, the regional agency reports, and before I forget, Suzanne, why don't you go through um, the reports, the regional agency advisory committee, uh, and that, cause I know you wanted to highlight, especially the planning activities and the highways 
Uh, and uh, so let's go ahead and take it away. Okay, um, what I was hoping to, to share with the board was, uh, oops, I didn't do it very well, there we go, um, was a quick update on the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and then we can get to some of the other reports. So um, I don't know what category we wanna put this under, but um, I, I sent you all a memo or a couple of memos that I, um, was gener generously provided by uh, MTC and county staff, Marissa Montenegro. Um, and I put together this quick PowerPoint just to run through some of the key points of the in Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, overall, it's great news um, in terms of an increase in funding, um, about a, over 100% increase from the FAST Act. So the, that's the surface transportation piece of the infrastructure bill. Um, California does really well, the Bay Area does really well, and there are a number of new programs where we have um, some pretty interesting opportunities. Um, there is a very significant increase in formula funds uh, for the five-year totals. Um, the new bridge, flexible new bridge repair formula, EV charging, um, there's a very heavy focus on resilience and resilience-focused investments. Um, and even the highway performance program, 15% is carved out for <laughs> highway and bridge resilience. So lots of details need to still emerge about what this all means, but overall really good news. In addition, the trade corridors and active transportation program, can uh, we can expect those to grow um, at the state level based on the, the new levels of federal funds. Uh, but I would note we do still need state legislation for the new programs. So there's that's opportunity as well to try and tailor them more for Bay Area um, needs and what you know we may see as priorities in Sonoma County. Uh, the formula funding levels for the Bay Area are again really significantly up uh, for transit. It's great news uh, overall. There's an additional billion dollars in uh, formula funds for transit for the Bay Area uh, over the FAST Act dollars. Um, and then on the other uh, transportation programs, and these are what typically make up the One Bay Area grant program. Uh, you see an increase from about 880 million to 1.1 billion. So over 200 million um, increase in funding there over the five year uh, life of the bill. Uh, in the Bay Area, there is um, a lot of opportunity for both the formula programs and the discretionary grant programs. The grant programs are, that are in the federal bill are very much in alignment with Plan Bay Area 2050 and are sort of large metro friendly, which is good news for us. Um, MTC has identified about 140 billion in grant funding that could fund Bay Area priority projects. Um, about 100 billion of that is guaranteed funding. Funding the other 40 billion still would have to go through the appropriation process, so is a little less certain. The other elements of the bill, uh, while obviously SCTA's focus is on the transportation infrastructure. Um, there are other elements of the bill that are very much in the wheelhouse of RCPA, um, but overall the other elements include funding for airports, ports and waterways, water, broadband, power infrastructure, and then resilience, western water storage, and environmental remediation. Um, so some of the key highlights there is a voucher program for low-income families for internet service. Um, the Administration says there are 10.6 million Californians who could be uh, who could benefit from that. There is uh, 65 billion in the in the bill to upgrade power infrastructure and increase energy efficiency. It's broken up into uh, several programs. Um, there's five billion in grants to states and grid operators. Uh, five billion to demonstration projects aimed at hardening and enhancing grid resilience. 3 billion for smart grid investment matching grant program and 550 million for energy efficiency and conservation block grants. I'm very curious about that one in particular given our Bayron work and how, uh, how those funds are gonna flow. 
Uh, in addition to that energy efficiency money, there's 3.5 billion to supplement the weatherization assistance program. Um, there is 24 million for San Francisco Bay restoration, which will go through EPA. Um, there's also 132 million for the National Estuary Program, of which 4.5 million would come directly to San Francisco um, Estuary Partnership. And there is 8 billion for water storage, recycling, and ecosystem restoration for California and other waste Western states uh, related to resiliency during drought. So tons of tons of stuff, a lot to figure out. This just happened, as you know, what, late Friday, early Saturday. Uh, so um, we'll be digging into it and working with our partners to, to figure out where we you know, can fit in and, and try and, and uh, get funds, you know, headed this direction. But it's uh, exciting to have this piece done. It helps with the One Bay Area grant uh, discussions at MTC, because now we know what the funding levels are. And so we'll have a better sense of how much will come to us. Uh, and it's great news for transit as well. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, that's amazing. It is just um, considering the fact that it was a pared down uh, amount of funding. Look at all the funding that are is actually incorporated in the bills. And I do serve on the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, and I'm giving a great big Heidi Ho and and recognizing the importance of uh, the largest estuary on the western coast of the United States and actually the Americas. So it's, it's, and the Sonoma Bay Lands is a project that uh, is being funded by the Restoration Authority. We can all think of projects that would neatly fit into any of those categories. Uh, I, and I'm not sure whether you said, did you send out those pow the PowerPoints to the board members? Could you do uh, that? Yeah, sure. Drew will post it and then, uh, but I'll send it out as well. Okay. And I'm sure there will be lots of conversations in your city council chambers as well as the board of supervisors uh, talking about potential opportunities and being sort of um, distressed by the time lag that will happen as they start to dispense the funding. Uh, board comments? Director Kelly has her hand up. Director Kelly? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just had a question, uh, and I, I'm sure you can imagine what it may be about, but um, as unfortunately as Smart Extensions North to Healdsburg and Cloverdale was not <laughs> included in Plan Bay Area 2050, um, we are very eager to identify sources of funding that would not be um, you know, directly flowing through MTC because we have yet again been excluded from that plan. Um, but we would love to work with SCTA and, and state sources and federal sources of funds to identify avenues to um, go after that funding. So as this uh, starts to, as the dust starts to settle on the allocation of funds, and, and we are so grateful um, that they were able to move this forward in DC, um, we would love to see avenues to, to try to go after some of that funding and, and SCTA to work with SMART um, and so many of our SMART colleagues that are on, on this body, um, you know, how we can help uh, advocate for that. And if there's uh, avenues that seem to be presenting themselves, uh, Suzanne, we would love to know and also to work in, in you know, collaboration to, to go after that money. Well, I see Director Bagby with a great big smile on her face. And I want to assure you that you have at least one member of SETA who is thinking similar thoughts and at every opportunity talking about the importance of that funding. So go, Melanie. Yeah, I think that, um, you yeah, know, we have um, the rail presidency or the, ra the rail president and a bike riding um, secretary of transportation. Um, how do we bring some of this money home for SMART? And I mean, I, you know, I think that it's reflected in our, the, the previous item under ULI and it's encouraging us to act regionally, you know, um, when, when are we going to, you know, as a, as a group, as a county, support each other's projects? Because it's the connectivity um, that, that is going to benefit all of us, you know. Um, the, making sure that there are the, the right number of stations in Petaluma, it, it's important for people in Cloverdale because I have my constituents here going to jobs 
in Petaluma and, and vice versa. Um, you know, one of the key components, I'll remind this board as well, is, um, you know, ecotourism being a very part of the economic development plan countywide, our connectivity with, um, with Marin, the, um, the economic community that we have up and down the 101 corridor is served by SMART. SMART was a key um, fire break, you know, and during the 2017 fires and was, you know, called out again in the ULI report. It is, it is vitally uh, important that we complete the line that we have and that it is a, it's a transportation um, priority for all of us, regardless of, you know, if you're in Sonoma Valley, wherever you are, it's the backbone of our, um, our com commute potentially our, our tourism corridor. So um, I would just, you know, urge us to make sure that we are eligible to for those rail dollars. And the way that we need to, to do that to complete the line to Cloverdale is that we need to be on the regional transportation plan. We've, you know, gone round and round on this. So what's it going to take to make that happen? Well, I think that I think there are two questions here, and this is not a smart board meeting. I suspect that smart will have a similar kind of analysis of the infrastructure bill to talk about what is in it for smart. And so maybe you'll get a two for there. But I think the point is well taken. And, um, and Suzanne and maybe David, we've had conversations about why uh, this linkage is not included in the regional plan. But are the, is there any hope in, in return uh, to include this? Well, I know that Suzanne and I have been talking about it. I've been talking about it with Alex Bachman and uh, Therese McMillan and everyone else at, um, at MTC in terms of the plan forward is an amendment of that um, plan and uh, getting it in that way. I think the good thing about these dollars um, you know, increased funding overall is going to provide better opportunity, less, you know, uh, more projects, uh, but more dollars flowing into the system, which would only benefit um, smart going uh, north. And we are, um, there are mega projects within the Bay Area. And, um, you know, it makes it, uh, makes it also very, um, uh, very, very competitive going forward too. There are big dollars, but there are big projects. Um, Suzanne, anything more from what David added? No, I mean, I think I, I, I'm sure SMART will have great strategies. I don't think there's anything that this board is able to do to change what is happening or what has happened with Plan Bay Area unless mm -hmm. and until there's funding to ask for an amendment to the plan, which is what we've talked about here before. Um, but SMART is far more versed in that than I, uh, and I'm... Conversation to be continued, and I'm sure we will hear from Melanie again. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie, you great advocacy for the North County. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, Drew, do we have any public comments on uh, this report from our executive director? Uh, yes, we have uh, one public comment at the moment. Let me get that timer up. Share screen. Where to go? Where to go? Oh, there it is. Alrighty, so we have a hand up from Ty Tyra Benoit. Ty, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Hi everyone, um, thank you very much. And I'm on the CAAC advisory board from Healdsburg and I've been attending your meetings for quite some time. And I wanna thank you for especially um, Melanie and Delinda for really speaking up at this meeting and pushing because everything can be possible if we just collaborate a little more. And I'd like to, end my comment with a statement from David Attenborough, who was just speaking in Glasgow 
um, at the COP26 conference, and I look forward to Supervisor Hopkins coming home and giving us a report in this. But he says, and I quote, we are, after all, the greatest problem solvers to have ever existed on Earth. If working apart, we are a force powerful enough to destabilize our planet, surely working together, we're powerful enough to save it. And I would apply that to Sonoma County as well. Surely in your roles as leaders in your communities, you are able to come together and figure out how to do some of these countywide projects to prioritize things and to work together. Um, Attenborough finishes by saying in his lifetime, I've witnessed a terrible decline. In the lifetimes of our children and grandchildren, we could witness a wonderful recovery, end of quote, but we've got to be courageous enough to act. So thank you for considering some of these actions that you've talked about today. Thank, thank you, too. Uh, Chair Gordon, I don't see any other members of the public who wish to speak. Great, thank you. Um, we often don't have re a time enough to report from RCPA activities, planning activities, and especially the highways, the update on the state highway projects. And so Suzanne, which of those uh, might be important to highlight this afternoon in our remaining time? Uh, we've got all three folks teed up and can get through them pretty quickly, I think, if that's all Good. right. Let's so, do it. Uh, what's first on the agenda? RCPA activities. All right. BC. Uh, hello, can you hear me? All right. Great. Oh, fantastic. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and directors. Uh, I just want to, uh, my name is BC Katz, Climate Change Program Specialist here with RCPA, uh, and wanted to take just a minute or two to give you an update on some of our main activities over the course of the last uh, month or so. Um, following up on a month ago at our board meeting, uh, I, myself, and Doria Stella from the County's Energy and Sustainability Division provided a uh, presentation to you all on the services available from the Bay Area Regional Energy Network. So we've continued to implementation, uh, our work on the implementation of that continues to move forward. And uh, there's been quite a bit of lot work um, at the larger level recently um, on the codes and standards program. And a lot of work that I've been actually diving into myself on um, building energy reach codes. And so that's something that uh, um, uh, has been a, a kind of a focus for the last few weeks. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to come back and give a, uh, an updated presentation to uh, the board sometime uh, in the next couple of months. Um, in addition to that work, uh, we're also we're going to uh, we are going to be having a members and partners meeting for our RCPA staff context on Monday, and I'm going to be giving them a preview of some of that uh, codes and standards work uh, on Monday of this upcoming uh, a week from now. Uh, other highlights: uh, Chris Cohn on our uh, RCPA staff continues to move forward with the water upgrade saves program. Um, and service is uh, continuing in, uh, she's working with both Sebastopol and the city of Cloverdale with uh, um, the, getting the service uh, up and running in those two um, jurisdictions. And one of the key highlights uh, recently has been also trying to make deeper contacts with um, uh, the South Bay um, and trying to work directly through the Santa Clara Valley Water District as a, uh, they are the water wholesaler for uh, the entire, for much of the entire South Bay can be a, uh, a very um, key partner for us uh, with thinking about expansion of that program into other parts of the Bay Area. So Chris has been giving a lot of uh, focus really on, um, on making, those, uh, making those connections recently. Um, also following up on our work, the Bay Run presentation from last month, uh, we had made the offer at the end of the meeting for, uh, to come and present to any of your city councils who may like to get additional information um, so I wanted to let you know, I've been, uh, been approached by two jurisdictions and we're currently scheduled to present in the next month to both the city of Rona Park and the city of Windsor, or the town of Windsor. So looking forward to those. Um, I'm retooling that presentation. So it's really focused in on services that are directly, uh, really can directly help your residents and your businesses. Um, so if there's any other jurisdictions that are interested in having, uh, uh, working with me to get that scheduled, uh, most likely for some time in the early part of next year, I'd be very interested to uh, uh, work with you all to get those scheduled. A um, couple other quick highlights. Um, 
Let's see. Oh, and I guess the other major thing I wanted to mention is I've also been working quite a lot with the jurisdictions on the proposed gas station bans, uh, which was uh, uh, brought as a recommended, uh, recommended uh, resolution uh, from this board a couple of months ago. Um, as you all know, uh, City of Petaluma is complete with theirs. Uh, they moved forward in March. And most recently, the uh, City of Sebastopol uh, received uh, kind of um, uh, took that item to their planning commission in October and are going to move forward. And the um, Town of uh, Windsor Council, the Town Council voted to move forward uh, and granted their staff the permission to continue working on that and move forward. Uh, so they did not adopt anything but gave staff <laughs> guidance to continue to uh, move, uh, continue to take that through the city process. And the last thing on that I wanted to mention is we held a meeting, um, it was also sometime in mid-October, where we met with uh, all uh, staff from all of the jurisdictions as well as Permit Sonoma to talk through the general topic of these gas station bans and to identify kind of areas of concern or areas where there needs to do some additional research. Um, so that's something that I've kind of continued to work through and Tanya and I are um, kind of, uh, each of the jurisdictions will need to make their own decisions as to how they would like to move forward and when they would like to move forward with a, a, a ban on the construction of new gas stations, but uh, we're working here to kind of try to identify what are some of those uh, legal issues and uh, kind of what are some of the resources that we can pull together here. Um, so I've been working quite a lot with uh, Chris Barney on our staff with preparing some new GIS maps uh, that, that may be useful for the jurisdictions. So um, I think with that, I will, uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, I wanna say thank you. That kind of concludes my report. And if there's any questions, I'll take those. Otherwise, we'll pass it along to uh, uh, to next. Thank you. Thank you, uh, BC. Great job, boy. You are busy, uh, and thank you so much for working with all of our jurisdictions. It's one thing that we've been consistent about is SCTA and RCPA staff working with all of our cities and county. All right. The next is planning activities oh, report. Uh, Chair Gordon, I do see that uh, uh, Director Bagby's hand is up. Thank you. Director Bagby. Oh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just, oh, thank you so much, BC, for a great report. I would just um, really urge you and, and staff to um, just on the, the language around the gas station issue that we keep it to being a new gas station moratorium as opposed to a gas station ban, because <laughs> I, I think that out in the public, there's a, you know, mm -hmm. there was a concern about, hey, you wanted to take away my natural gas. And you're going to dig up my natural gas line, and I just put in a gas fireplace. And I'm I'm concerned that there's going to be kind of the same backlash um, for people who rightfully so have gasoline uh, cars, and they want to make sure that they can still continue to get gasoline for their car until they move over to a um, to a full electric. Um, I just think it's important for this agency and, and others when we're out, you know, communicating with the public that that this is a transition issue, just like we're going to continue to invest in our, our roads and our infrastructure for for buses and bicycles and pedestrian safety. You know, we're, we're going to continue to have um, gas stations as as long as we still need them, which hopefully isn't very long. So <laughs> I would just encourage, urge, urge board members and staff to um, phrase it in um, the um, moratorium for new ones language. Thank you. Um, good reminder. Uh, and planning activities report, then followed by the highways. Good afternoon, directors. I will highlight a few um, items on our planning activities report this month, starting with data management and forecasting. Staff are currently working with local agencies to fund and development develop a vehicle miles traveled reduction and mitigation calculator to help local planning and engineering staff implement SB 743, the MT estimation requirements. The project team will be holding a kickoff meeting on December 2nd and soliciting additional feedback on the project scope and approach at the December planning advisory committee and technical advisory committee meetings. And my colleague, Chris Barney is available to answer any questions about recent modeling and data related work. On the planning front, uh, last month, staff submitted the grant application for a countywide active transportation plan to Caltrans for the Sustainable Communities Transportation Planning Grant, which we presented on at this board's October meeting. And we expect to hear whether we're su successful in that in the spring. 
Uh, thanks to the local jurisdictions and our partners, we submitted the application with 21 letters of support, which was great. Um, and on the program management side, as part of the Safe Routes to School program, the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition celebrated International Walk and Roll to School Month in October with all comprehensive partner schools and continued classroom and on bike education as well. And for the regional bike share program, staff has been working with the bike share operator, Bolt, and local jurisdictions on refining hub locations and site plans. And complete sets of site plans and permit applications are being drafted for submittal to each participating jurisdiction currently. And we anticipate that all permit approvals will be complete by mid-January. So that concludes my report and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dana. Really appreciate all the work that you do and for providing this report. A lot of great things in here. Uh, a highways report, James Cameron. All right, so I have a couple projects to highlight on the highways report. The first project I'll highlight is our carpool light widening through Petaluma that's shown as project number four. Last month, we successfully shifted traffic to start stage three, which is our final stage of the project uh, that was um, complete, completed. And also we were able to complete the nighttime demolition of the existing structure over the smart railroad track. So there will not be any more nighttime demolition on the project. Uh, the northbound third lane was opened uh, north of Lynch Creek to the north project limits. And uh, the section south of Lynch Creek uh, in the northbound direction will be opened later this month uh, or early next month, weather dependent, uh, completing all planned northbound carpool lanes in Sonoma County. Uh, the southbound lanes are on schedule to be opened about a year from now in late 2022. Second project that I want to highlight for everyone on the high report is State Route 37. It's shown as project number seven in the report. Uh, and want to make the board aware of a Caltrans virtual public meeting that's scheduled for November 17th at 5.30 p.m. It'll be on Zoom. It's the Environmental Impact Report and Environmental Assessment Scoping Meeting for the State Route 37 improvements from US 101 to State Route 121. So to give a little background on what that project is and the overall program, uh, keep in mind, Resilient 37 is a complex multi-million dollar program with solutions that are both intermediate, interim, and uh, long-term. Uh, the immediate solutions are those tractor-mounted pumps that you'll see out there that Caltrans staging prior to storm events, as well as some of the emergency repairs that they have had to make um, on the highway to keep it open. The long-term or the ultimate solutions are moving forward with planning efforts uh, like the planning and environmental linkages study that's being conducted, conducted with extensive stakeholder engagement and public outreach, as well as um, looking at alternatives from an elevated causeway to retreating and addressing sea level rise through the end, end of the century. The interim uh, solutions that are being pro proposed on a parallel path uh, to the ultimate solution uh, because those interim improvements can be delivered on a faster accelerated timeline. Of the several interim solutions that are moving forward, I wanted to highlight two, right? So the first is the, uh, the, the viability of transit from Sears Point to Mare Island, uh, where there was an environmental scope and meeting uh, last July or July of 20, actually. And, uh, and then that document will be released later this month or in early December with a follow-up meeting in mid-December to January to comment on the environmental document itself, the draft EIREA. The second one is the public meeting that I mentioned at the beginning, which is scheduled for November 17th at 5.30. Uh, it's, it proposes to elevate and reconstruct the waterway along State Route 37 from 101 to 121 and to reduce recurring flooding issues due to sea level rise with the outlook of 2050. So that mid-century outlook to not have to do those emergency repairs that Caltrans has been having to do. They'll host the public meeting November 17th from 5.30 to 7.30 uh, to receive input on the project and the scoping period is open now, will be open through December 2nd. Posted on the Caltrans website, the SCTA website. We put a link in our newsletter, as well as Drew will be sending out a link to the board um, along with the, the, the presentation materials that he normally sends out. That concludes the highway report for today. 
Thank you, James. Really appreciate your work. Um, Highway 37 is important for a number of us. It's a critical linkage for goods, transportation, and employees uh, going back and forth. And I'm not sure I'm going to be around till by 2050. So could you get it moving <clears throat> faster than that, please? <laughs> Okay, um, that completes our SCTA RCPA meeting for this evening. I think it's going to deliver some uh, serious rain tonight, so be safe. And if you don't have to go out, please don't. And uh, hopefully uh, we, our ground is still thirsty enough to absorb a lot of the water. So thank you so much, and we will adjourn for tonight until we meet again next month. Thank you. Thank you, be safe.